Hello students, this is your economics coach Pratik Vaseen back with a new chapter. In today's chapter, we will be discussing about infrastructure. This is your 8th chapter in Indian economic development for class 11th. Infrastructure, you must have heard about the word infrastructure many times. In the first chapter, under which the Britishers had developed infrastructure in India, but they did not succeed in fully developing it. We also discussed about the word infrastructure in chapter 3 where we were discussing that LPG reforms did not succeed fully. We also discussed about some causes of poverty in which the main cause was infrastructure was lacking in India. So now what is infrastructure? Infrastructure is basically the supporting services which help other industries like agriculture or primary sector, manufacturing sector or secondary sector and tertiary sector. Examples of infrastructure are roads, railways, warehouses, gas pipelines, dams, banking, education and health facilities etc. These help other industries to grow. Let's take an example of a farmer. So there is a farmer who grows wheat. Now to transport his wheat, he needs that there must be properly built roads in his village. He also wants to store that crops in a warehouse. He also needs credit whenever he starts with the sowing season. So all these services consist of infrastructure. So infrastructure is basically of two types. The first type of infrastructure is economic infrastructure. The second type of infrastructure is social infrastructure. Economic infrastructure directly contributes to GDP, but social infrastructure indirectly contributes to GDP. Economic infrastructure helps the economy from within, but social infrastructure helps the economy from outside. Economic infrastructure increases the quality of economic resources, but on the other hand, social infrastructure increases the quality of manpower. Let us take examples of economic infrastructure. So the example of economic infrastructure is roads, railways, communication, banking, etc. Examples for social infrastructure are health, education, sanitation, healthy drinking water. All these are examples of social infrastructure. Now let us move on to importance of infrastructure. Now what is the importance of infrastructure? The first and the foremost importance of infrastructure is that it improves productivity or it increases productivity. Now let us take an example of a village which does not have electricity. That means it has not been electrified yet. So all the businesses will be suffering there. Now let us take an example that a small scale or a cottage industry is being set up there which produces cloth. Now they would be using a hand loom. Hand loom uses the power of the labourer to weave cloth. Let us suppose the daily limit is 20 meters of cloth being weaved there. Now if the village is electrified, this means that the productivity will increase because the cottage industries would be using power loom instead of hand loom. Now let us suppose they weave around 200 meters of cloth every day. So this increases the productivity. Let us take another example. Now let us suppose there is a farmer who is unable to get credit for agriculture. Now if he is not able to get credit, he will be using inferior quality seeds which will give him lesser output. But if banking facilities were available, he would have got higher output. So this is how provision of infrastructure increases productivity. The second point is it provides employment. So when infrastructure is being developed like construction of dams, 
roads, railways, airports or whenever electrification is being done in a village, it will generate employment. This employment may be direct or indirect. So, by provisioning of infrastructure, it also leads to generation of direct employment and also leads to increase in indirect employment. So, when an expressway is being developed on the both sides, hotels will be developed. This will provide indirect employment to the people in that area. Now, let us move ahead on the third point, which is it induces FDI. So, let us take the example of the same village. So, we have a village where electricity has not been provided yet. So, no foreign investor would be willing to invest in that village. Now, when that village is electrified, proper roads have been built, proper credit facilities are available to the people in that area, many foreign investors would be willing to invest in that area and set up their industries or manufacturing plants. So, this will induce FDI to India. The fourth point is, it increases the size of the market. Due to the growth of internet and communication facilities, many business owners have brought their businesses online. This has led to increase in the size of market. Now, they can sell their product worldwide. So, this has improved their market reach. Next point is, it increases the economic development. So, that specific village which was not electrified, no proper roads were built, no warehouse or storage facilities were available or no credit facilities were available. Now, when all these things are being provided, the production of goods and services will increase and this will raise the GDP. Therefore, economic development or economic growth will also increase. Now, we have the next point which is it improves human development. As we have discussed in the chapter human capital formation, human development means to invest in the health and education of a human because of welfare motives. So, when the government develops social infrastructure like building of schools, educational institutes, health facilities, this improves the availability of human capital or it leads to human development. The last point is, it increases outsourcing. Outsourcing refers to giving away the non-core activities so that a person or a company can focus on its core activities. So, what do we do? When in India, many people are being trained from educational institutes, they are healthy. So, this means that India can gather a whole lot of work from multinational companies and this will bring in outsourcing to India. This will also increase the GDP of India and also increase the tax revenues for India. Now, let us discuss some components of rural infrastructure. Why are we studying rural infrastructure? Because in urban areas, the growth of infrastructure or the situation of infrastructure is already strong. Rural areas lag behind, that is why we need to talk about rural infrastructure. Some components of rural infrastructure are, the first is proper drinking water. Drinking water is not properly available in rural areas. Those people have to walk long distances to fetch potable water. So, our government needs to focus on provision of proper drinking water to rural areas. Now, the next point is rural housing. Now, what happens is many people in the rural areas live in kacha houses. At times of floods, they are worsely affected. So, our government should take up some plans to develop houses for them that is pakka houses should be built for them. The next point is irrigation facilities. As we already know, most of the people in rural areas are dependent upon agriculture. So, irrigation facilities form an integral part of agriculture. Hence, they should be provided free of cost or at subsidized rate to everyone. The next point is rural roads. At the time of floods or any natural calamity, Rural areas are the worst affected because of the roads. As the roads are not all weather roads, so the link between urban areas and rural areas gets broken at the time of calamities. So, the government should provide 
proper roads or all weather roads so that they stay connected 365 days a year. Then it is rural telephony. In rural areas, communication facilities have not been developed yet. In urban areas, the tele density is very high. Tele density refers to the number of phones per 100 population. But in rural areas, it is very low. So, we need to develop communication facilities for rural areas. And the last and the foremost point is electrification. Now, there are many rural areas which have not been electrified yet. So, the government should take steps to electrify the villages completely. Now, let us talk about the state of rural infrastructure. The first point is that in rural areas, people still use crop residues like stubble, cow dung or firewood to meet their heating, lighting and cooking requirement or for their energy requirements. The second point is they walk long distances to fetch water. The third point is 56 percent of the villages have electricity, rest 43 percent depend upon kerosene for their energy requirements. The fourth point is 94 percent of the villages have potable drinking water within their reach. And the fifth point is only 40 percent of the rural households have proper sanitation facilities. Although government's plan of Clean India mission to make India open defecation free has been a success, but things need to be done in the future as well. You will be surprised to know that India's investment in infrastructure is only 34 percent which is much behind China, Sri Lanka and other neighboring countries. Now let us move ahead and talk about our first component of infrastructure which is energy. Energy is an important resource for industries, agriculture and households because it caters to their cooking, heating and lighting requirements. So, our government should really focus on development of energy because it is the backbone of the economy. Now, this energy can be classified according to two bases. The first basis is on the basis of price paid. So, on the basis of price paid, energy can be of two types. The first is commercial energy and the next one is non-commercial energy. Now, let us talk about commercial and non-commercial energy. Commercial energy is the energy for which prices are paid. It is bought and sold in the market like any other commodity. But non-commercial energy is free. It is not bought and sold in the market. Commercial energy is used basically for production purposes. It is basically used by industries. But non-commercial energy is used majorly for domestic purposes. Examples of non-commercial energy are cow dung, firewood, agricultural waste. And on the other hand, the examples for commercial energy are coal, petroleum and electricity. You will be surprised to know that around 74 percent of the energy requirements are met through commercial sources and only 26 percent of the energy requirement is met by non-commercial sources. Now, we can also classify energy on the basis of renewability. So, on the basis of renewability, energy is of two types. The first is conventional sources and the next is non-conventional sources. Conventional sources are traditional sources which have been used for a long period of time. Non-conventional sources are modern sources of energy which have come to use recently. Conventional sources of energy are generally non-renewable and they are polluting. But non-conventional sources, because they have been developed recently, they are non-polluting and they are generally renewable. Some examples of conventional sources of energy are coal, petroleum and electricity. Examples of non-conventional sources are solar energy, wind energy and tidal energy. Hydroelectricity, although being non-polluting, is an example of conventional sources. Now, let us discuss the sectoral share of commercial energy. You will be surprised to know that most of the commercial energy is 
consumed by industries which is around 44% of the total commercial energy. Households occupy the second major consumer position which is around 23%. Agriculture is the third top most consumer of commercial energy around 18%. Transport consumes only 2% of the commercial energy and others consume around 13% of the commercial energy. Now let's move ahead and talk about power or electricity. You will be surprised to know that for every 8% increase in GDP, the power supply needs to increase by at least 12%. This means that for every 1% of increase in GDP, the power supply should increase by 1.5%. So we have some sources of electricity generated and most of the electricity is generated from thermal sources which is around 67% of the total energy generated. Non-conventional sources contribute around 17.3% of the total energy generated. Nuclear energy occupies a mere 2.1% of the total energy generated and hydroelectricity is around 13.6%. Of this complete chart, we find it disheartening that India is unable to utilize its nuclear capabilities because the global average of nuclear power generation is around 13% and India generates only 2% of energy from nuclear sources. While talking about this, there is an important topic which is challenges of the power sector. Our power sector has been under a lot of stress from a long period of time. There are some challenges which are being faced by the power sector, the first one being insufficient installed capacity. In India, the requirement of energy is much greater than what can be produced. And on top of it, only 20,000 megawatts per annum is being added to the total installed capacity. Now, the second challenge is we are not able to utilize this energy properly. We are insufficiently utilizing the energy which is actually not good for our economy because we have more demand, less supply and we are not able to utilize the capacity that we have installed. The next point is losses incurred by state electricity boards. The state electricity boards have accumulated losses of around 500 billion rupees which is equal to 50,000 crore rupees. These state electricity boards have suffered from inefficiency which has piled up their losses. Now these state electricity boards have only two ways ahead of them. They can either increase the power tariffs or they can either make power cuts. But both of these lead to public unrest which brings to my fourth challenge which is public unrest. So public unrest is caused due to increase in power tariffs or power cuts. Now let's talk about the fifth challenge which is shortage of raw material for thermal power plants. So thermal power plants because they use coal as a raw material there is a major shortage of coal in the country due to which these thermal power plants are not able to fully utilize their potential. We also talk about the uncertain role of the private sector. The private players have been allowed to enter the energy sector or the electricity generation and distribution sector but they haven't showed keen interest in this sector. So they should be motivated and brought into the playing field so that they also contribute to the electricity generation process. Then we have the operational inefficiency. Operational efficiency of a thermal plant is measured through PLF which is plant load factor. In India, no plant is being run at 100% capacity. So there should be some steps to be taken so that plant load factor may be improved. Now let's move on to our next topic which is measures to improve the power sector. The first and the foremost measure to improve the power sector is that we learn to conserve energy. We must use energy saving equipments. We should use LEDs or CFLs which save energy. We should also reduce the unnecessarily utilization of energy. So by taking these steps, we can reduce the demand of energy. The second point is 
we should try to improve the plant load factor that is the government should take steps to improve the plant load factor which will improve the efficiency of the thermal plants. Next is there should be more participation from the private sector because a whole lot of private sector is waiting for some tax concession or tax holidays or subsidies from the government so that they can actually enter into the power generation sector. Next we have use of renewable sources. New and renewable sources should be developed and should be used and should be replacing the non-renewable sources that the government should take steps to reduce transmission and distribution losses. These are the losses which take place when the electricity is transmitted and provided to the end consumers. So the government or the electricity units should take steps to reduce these losses. Then we have a national grid should be developed. A national grid will actually help in reducing the gaps between demand and supply of energy. There are some areas in India which have more supply and less demand, but some areas are there which have more demand and less supply. So there should be a national grid which should unevenly distribute the energy according to areas. Then we have atomic energy. As we already discussed that India is not able to fully utilize the potential of energy generation. Only 2% of the energy comes from nuclear power, whereas the global average is 13%. So we should actually start the game and we should start utilizing our nuclear energy potential. So now let's summarize what all we have discussed in this chapter. We have discussed about infrastructure that these are supporting services which help other businesses. Then we discussed about types of infrastructure which was economic infrastructure and social infrastructure. We also discussed about the importance of infrastructure which included that it improves productivity, induces FDI, increases outsourcing. We also discussed about components of rural infrastructure. Then we discussed about the status, current status of the rural infrastructure. We also discussed about energy which was classified on the basis of price being commercial and non-commercial. We also discussed about energy on the basis of renewability which can be conventional or non-conventional. After that we discussed about some sectoral share of commercial energy. Then we talked about power or electricity. We also studied the challenges being faced by the power sector and in the end we discussed about the measures that can be taken to improve the power sector. We will be discussing this chapter in the next class completely with health sector being discussed in the next class.